Good afternoon, everyone. Who's ready to resist? They're ready. My name is uh, Igor Volsky. I'm the deputy director of the Center for American Progress Action Fund. After the election, uh, our work really changed. We began developing tools uh, for people to use to defeat Trump care, to oppose almost every Trump initiative, uh, and thought a lot about how to channel all of the great energy uh, that we saw in the aftermath of the election into tangible action, into tangible change. And so uh, I'm just so proud to, to have this amazing panel uh, here with me. I'm going to introduce them. We're going to get into a conversation about what has worked in this new resistance movement, how we sustain the energy uh, and the resistance over the long haul, how we translate that into real political power, and then uh, we'll have some time for questions. So immediately to my right uh, is Marcos Molitsas. He's the founder and publisher of Daily Cost, the largest liberal online community in the United States, reaching up to 20 million unique visitors per month. His new book, The Resistance Handbook, 45 Ways to Fight Trump, will be out next month. Next to him is Leah Greenberg. She's the co-founder of Indivisible, an organization that is at the front lines of fueling a progressive grassroots network to defeat the Trump agenda. Over 5,900, and I looked on the website yesterday to make sure, uh, local groups, because it's growing every day, uh, with at least two in every congressional district are using the Indivisible Guide to hold their members of Congress accountable. In uh, 2007, Leah caught a, br a lucky break by interning at the Center for American Progress with Igor Volsky. <laughs> it's just That's uh, nepotism. So nice of you to put this on your official bio. Uh, Astrid Silva is an immigration activist and dreamer who delivered the Spanish response to Donald Trump's address to a joint session of Congress. She's the co-founder of Dream Big Vegas, a community-based organization in Nevada that focuses on educating the community on the importance of supporting undocumented youth and their family. And then last but certainly not least is DeRay McKesson. He's a civil rights activist, organizer, educator, and the co-founder of Campaign Zero, the Resistance Manual, and the podcast Pod Save the People, which you should all subscribe to on iTunes. Leave a review as well. Uh, <laughs> Spurred by the death of Mike Brown and the subsequent protests in Ferguson, Missouri, DeRay has worked to connect individuals with knowledge and tools and provide citizens and policymakers with common sense policies to ensure equity and justice. Please welcome this wonderful panel. So, Leah, I want to start with you, uh, as a former colleague of mine, uh, to, to talk about uh, indivisible really being on the front lines of this new resistance, of this new energy. Can you give us a sense of what tools, what tactics have really worked uh, in, I think, ensuring that this president, you know, doesn't have too many good days in office? She's number four. All right, is that better? Yeah, yeah. All right, great. Hi, everyone. Um, so I think what we've found uh, in the days since the in the days since the election, um, what's worked is decentralization. Um, what's worked is asking people to take on more than they were necessarily comfortable with. Um, and what's worked is talking to people about sort of the strategy and about building power and how you do it and um, having faith in them to sort of start to figure out how, how they put those pieces together um, on a local level themselves. So um, when we wrote the Indivisible Guide uh, back in November, we had sort of a, a really simple theory, which was that a, a lot of people were already organizing. Um, we had pulled together friends right after the election in our, in our living room and we had said, you know, we don't know what we're going to do, but we, we got to do something. And it had become clear to us that that was like not an isolated thing. Can I just ask, actually, um, how many people got together with, with colleagues or friends or neighbors immediately after the election and you had one of those meetings? Right. Um, and I've asked that question in a, a lot of different rooms and with a lot of different people and get really similar replies. Um, people were already starting to organize themselves and they were looking for 
ways to do it. And I think what we found was people were, um, they were looking to do more than make a call. They were looking to uh, take ownership of something that they could really feel invested in, in, in reacting to um, what they perceived as a really uh, extraordinary result of the election. Uh, Marcos refers to himself as the granddaddy of the resistance. Uh, so, <laughs> so, geriatric. <laughs> so let me ask you, uh, you've been at this with Daily Cause for a long, long time. Uh, Daily Coast. Daily Coast, I'm so sorry, Daily Coast. What do, you, uh, what do you make of this new energy? And do, is your sense that it's moving in the right direction in terms of ensuring that it's a sustainable movement for years to come? Yeah, there's a couple of factors I think that make this super exciting in a way that uh, past movements. I, I came out of the sort of the Dean campaign, and the Dean campaign looked a lot like the Bernie Sanders one, right? very white, very male, and, uh, and realized very early on that a movement could not sustain itself in progressive politics if that's who was represented. And, and for years and years afterwards, Daily Coast sort of kind of reflected that. And, uh, and, and I'm Latino. Uh, my name doesn't give it away, but soy Latino. And um, I sort of tamped that down. There, there was sort of like I was like, the, I'm gonna be mainstream coast. And uh, and from the beginning, we were focused on elections, and we were focused on trying to, to generate grassroots excitement over things like state legislative races, and and nobody gave a shit uh, because they wanted to argue about whether Obama was good enough or not, and and whether the healthcare law was good or not and whether Bernie Sanders or Hillary Clinton, and it was all these stupid arguments while the grassroots was burning. That's exactly what happened. So systematically, Republicans being Republicans and very, very um, organized and smart uh, did what they did, and they took over uh, elected office from the, from the bottom up to the point where we got to last year where a, a idiot buffoon with no campaign beat our candidate. Probably would have been the smartest president in American history. And so, this new movement that sort of emerged is exciting for a couple of reasons. One, unlike most past movements, it is almost entirely electorally focused, which is, is critical. I mean, their sister district uh, has hundreds of chapters, and they're focused on state legislative races. I mean, I could never get anybody excited about state legislative races, but there they are organizing, uh, swing left on, on house races. So Indivisible doing just all of the above and, and more. and. Uh, Furthermore, beyond that, though, is the fact that this is the future of America right here. <laughs> the Center for American Progress did not have to go out of its way to find diversity for this panel. And you know, one, one little fact, before the election, Daily Coast readership was about 65 male, 35% female. And almost my entire editorial team is women. So it, it wasn't that there was a lack of women, female voices. It was for whatever reason, I don't know why, those voices People that did not come. The day after the Women's March, it was 50-50, literally overnight. So you have a movement that's really built on communities of color and women, and now you have a movement that is being led by communities of color and women. And so this is the future of the country, and this movement, that's why I think it's lasting power, because it looks like the Democratic Party, it looks like America, and it is focused on the important things, which is you do not get to wield power unless you win elections. Duray, you ran for office. Uh, talk about uh, a bit about that experience, but also your um, your move into advocacy, into part of this larger resistance movement, and, and where you see it going. Yeah, I think that you know so much is so much has changed since we were in the street in Ferguson three years ago. You know, people forget that it was illegal to stand still in St. Louis in August, September, and October 2014. That if you stood still for more than five seconds, we were arrested immediately. <laughs> it was nuts. And when I say that, I say that because it's interesting that protest is now something that is like the most American thing that you can do, right? <laughs> People are like, everybody should protest. And we're like, when we were protesting, it was not this thing that everybody should do. <laughs> but what is really powerful is that well, we, when we think about protest, we think about it as this idea of telling the truth in public, that we use our bodies to tell the truth that Mike should be alive and Rakia and so many people, that we disrupted board meetings and commissions to tell the truth that they weren't using their institutional power in ways that benefit the lives of people of color. And we also know that protest is not the answer, but it creates space for the answer. And that's what we've seen happen all across the country. 
it's been incredible to see groups like The Indivisible sort of come in this moment and like create space for so many people to organize in ways that they didn't think they could do, and I think that that is incredible. We've also seen the power of social media, right? So before, as people of color and minorities, we've often faced these issues of erasure, and erasure mainly comes up in two ways. One, either the story is never told or it's told by everybody but us, and in this moment, we became the unerased. Like, everybody be became able to be their own storytellers and they were no longer gatekeepers. Again, I remember talking to the individual right when they started and it was like they could just put something online and millions of people could look at it and like that didn't exist before. I think about when we were in the street in Ferguson in those early days, it's like most of you knew us because of Twitter or because of Facebook. It wasn't because of the news. If you saw us on the news, we were like the worst people in America. But if you saw us online, you saw the truth about what was happening. When I think about running for office, you know, the people that did Bernie's fundraising did mine, and we raised, you know, a lot of money very quickly. And one of the key lessons there was that there's a lot more left to disrupt in this space, that the people who are like bread and butter, that they know all the answers, don't actually know all the answers. And if people knew the answers, we wouldn't be in this spot right now where, like, he's, this guy's the president who knew nothing, right? The last thing that I'll say is that I am worried about the left in some ways that we've been seduced to believe that the best idea always wins. And we know to be true is that the idea that is beat into people's head, that's the idea that wins. The idea that people can repeat at the dinner table is the idea that wins. And sometimes we forget that, that we are normally right about so many of the issues, but being right is actually not enough. And when I think about being in communities and talking about the police or safety, it's like we're not against the police, right? Well, we've always said, and the movement is that we're pro-safety, right? We want communities to be safe. And I've asked you where you feel the most safe is probably not in a room full of police. It's probably in a room where people care about you and love you. Like that's how we've started to talk about this issue because that's what people understand at the dinner table. That there's a wonkier way to talk about it, but that doesn't translate all the time. And that we can't be seduced to believe that the best idea is the idea that will always win. Astrid, for me, <laughs> Astrid, for me, one of the most inspiring pieces of. Uh, of advocacy, uh, of, uh, of uh, activism, was of course the Dreamer movement uh, that we saw. And I really have the strong sense that in some ways it's laid the groundwork for a lot of the great resistance movement that we see in this era of Trump. Can you talk about uh, how the, that movement inspired this resistance, uh, what this current resistance can learn from the Dreamer movement and everything it's been able to accomplish. You know, I think for me, one of the, one of the things, can you guys hear me? No? Hello? No? No. Hello? Too close. Too far? Too far? Okay. Here, sorry. Yep. Um, I think for me, one of the most important things uh, has been that. I think seeing everybody wake up on November 9th and say, we have to start resisting. This is something that my community, my family, has been doing since the day we set foot in the United States. Um, we've been resisting being deported. We've been resisting being labeled, um, all these things. And as you mentioned, all these labels is what is being heard at dinner tables that undocumented immigrants are, are rapists, that you know we, we do all these horrible things. And so for me, laying the groundwork has been that. It has been that our families have really demonstrated that, you know, we can't vote. Um, you know, I wish we could do civil disobedience, and many have done it and risked it with very big sacrifice. Um, and yet, you know, we've been able to, to get, um, you know, we're not out of the woods, we're, we're still living in fear, but we've been able to take control of our stories. We've been able to become the people that are defending ourselves with our allies. You know, I came of, of I don't know, awareness of, of political movements in, in 2009. Um, and I know that many people had been working on it far longer than I had, but in 2009 is when um, I really understood that for me, that was a time for me to get active, and that was because of, of Senator Reed in Nevada. And, you know, he was a politician who took a risk. He backed undocumented immigrants when people were telling him, you know, don't do it, it's not good polling, uh, you're, you're gonna lose. Um, and, and I think to me that really stuck with me because it's like, if you're willing to fight for yourself, we have to make sure our allies are there and that they're willing to fight for themselves. And right now, that's what we need to make sure we're doing. We need to make sure, you know, it's great to have 50,000 people vote, uh, marching, 
But if 10,000 show up for a municipal election, what are we doing? Where are we messing up? Well, Marcos, let me, let me ask you right along those lines, what are, as we move forward, as the resistance move forward, what are some of the pitfalls, as Astrid describes, for instance, not voting, not translating that energy into the voting booth, but what else should we be aware of to ensure we don't feel, fall into, into traps that don't keep this movement sustainable? So, um, yeah, you know, before I get to that, I actually wanna sort of reinforce a kind of a theme that, that we had here is, uh, if you're a white male Christian liberal, right now you're feeling pretty angsty, right? It's, oh shit, Donald Trump is president, and it's horrible. That's how we've all felt, always. And this is something that I think needs to be acknowledged, because there's a changing of the guard, and this kind of leads into, uh, in progressive leadership, to one where women and marginalized communities are centered. It doesn't mean they're part of the party anymore. They're leading it. And there is some resistance among some corners of that. Uh, and you see it in things like people saying, well, we need to reach out to working class people. Because, you know, none of us know any working class people in our communities. <laughs> and so there, there's code, right? It's not just Republicans talking in that kind of code. So I think that's gonna be one of the, one of the key issues that we need to sort of resolve and get past is that there is gonna be a changing of the garden, who leads the party, and it's good, because that, the party is gonna look like America, and uh, we're gonna be better positioned for the future. And, and the second one, and, and, and uh, Lee and I had, had dinner yesterday, and I talked about this, because there's a lot of excitement right now, and people are signing up, and they wanna do stuff, and, and this is great, and in 18 and 20, if all goes well, we're gonna have good electoral years, right? Because we had Donald Trump. Uh, but once upon a time, we had George Bush, right? And we won big in 2006 and 2008 because of, Donald, because of George Bush. And, uh, and then Obama won, and the day after, it was all about how pure Obama was in, in fighting, and, and we had sort of that grassroots burning thing, and, and our energy dissipated, and it sort of withered away. And so, to me, I'm actually less worried about 18 and 20, I mean, I'm worried in the sense that I'm working hard towards it, but I'm less worried about the future of the movement in the next four years than I am about what happens in 2022 when we're all arguing about how progressive our, our, our next president is and our next Congress is. And so it's going to be a challenge. Uh, you know, one of, the, one of the, I think, strategic mistakes that the Obama campaign did is to let uh, Organizing for America wither away. And so one of the challenges is we're outside of the party, so I think we have more control over that, is, is to make sure we continue to educate our people that this is a long-term movement. We're not fighting to defeat Donald Trump. That's just a sort of a way stop in this broader uh, movement because Republicans didn't stop organizing when Obama was president, and they're never gonna stop organizing, and we have to have that mentality of perpetual engagement that never ends, and it's exhausting, and it's it kind of almost frustrating to think about that, but if they don't give up, we cannot give up. And so I'm less worried about, like I said, the next four years than I am about what happens afterwards. Leah, Leah can you give us a sense of the advocates, the, the new activists that your group works with? What drives them? What motivates them? Who, who are these people? A great question. Um, it's working again. Okay. Um, yeah, I would say that we are seeing a whole, a real range of different stories coming together. Um, I think the most common story that I hear um, is, is a woman um, who, may, she voted before, but she um, may not have ever been politically involved before, and um, after November uh, had, had a reaction. Um, I think the, the, I've heard a couple of different versions of this, but the one that seems to resonate with the most folks is that they, you know, the reaction that people had was was sort of a sense of betrayal, um, that a lot of people who were activated right after November um, had faith in some element of American institutions to protect them from an outcome like this. Um, it was, you know, whether it was the media or elites or the parties or um, just generally the, the leaders that they trusted, um, they didn't expect that uh, American society could deliver an outcome like this. Um, and I think that goes to a little bit the demographics of the folks who were already resisting before because um, people who already had good reason to not have faith in the institutions of society um, had a different reaction uh, in November 9th. Yeah. 
Uh, Doray, it feels to me like that's really part of the tension of the resistance, that we live in an era where people don't trust their institutions, yet we're asking people to call their member of Congress to change an outcome of a piece of legislation. How do we balance those seemingly conflicting ideas? Yeah, it's a real tension, and I'll say, and I, it, people have talked about it a little bit, is that there's some people who think that the history of injustice began with the Muslim ban, right? It's like, if you think that that was the beginning, this is like a hard, a hard conversation to have. And that is real, though. There are people who are like, wow, America's so crazy. And we're like, America's being crazy. Um, so, so that is like one bucket of it. And then there is a question about like, why participate, right? The last time we went with President Obama around the police, he was, he was he were in this small room, and he's like, Dre, people should vote. And it's like, President Obama, you shaming people into voting is just not going to be a winning, this is like not going to be a winning strategy. I agree with you that people should vote, but people should understand voting as one way to build power. Being in the streets is a way to build power, calling your congressperson is a way to build power, voting is a way to build power. This idea that if you vote, the world will be a magically better place, just A, hasn't worked out for people. And B, like I got tear gassed in the street in many places and I voted my whole life, right? Like voting wasn't the day that I was gonna like save me. Right? Uh, when I think about Trump, it is, one of the things that I try to be mindful of is that he is the product, not the producer, right? He's like the physical embodiment of an ideology that has been around for a long time. And that part of our work is to make sure that we unpack that so we know exactly what the what is that we're fighting. So with immigration, is it actually about what communities look like? Is it about felons? Or is it about this idea of assimilation? Like I was in a room and somebody very interestingly was like, I just think that people should assimilate. Like, I think they should speak the language I speak. And that was actually their crux. Like, well, what I kept reading was this idea of like safety and felons, but really it was this idea that everybody should speak English and people that don't speak English should be, and you're like, that is a problem, but me understanding that as a core issue actually helps me think about this better, how I'm gonna respond to it. And then uh, the other thing I'll say around this like product, not the producer, is that we have to get to the, uh, to sort of the root cause of like, what is the actual issue? And one of the interesting things in the movement, sort of we got in the street in Ferguson a long time ago. Now it feels like a long time ago. It's really just a couple of years. And at this point, it's like, how do we make sure that activists have a, as much information as possible to actually do the good work of imagining what the future looks like, right? That opposition, some of resistance is opposition, but the other half of resistance is deep imagination, right? So I think about things like healthcare, it's like, there are a lot of people in this room who probably can't explain the difference between Medicare and Medicaid, which is not a knock on you, but it's hard to imagine how the system can be better when you just don't understand like fundamental things. And we've been trying to help people understand what are the fundamental things, the building blocks, so when you get into the room or you go to your individual meeting and you push your congressman, that you actually know enough so you can really challenge them about what the future looks like. Astrid. For me, part of the reason why the resistance has been successful is because you have people organizing within their communities. They're organizing in their school groups, they're organizing in their places of worship. You co-founded a community-based organization. Talk about the role that direct service community organizations play in, in the resistance in organizing uh, people in this way. Yeah, I and you know, I've never voted, voted or been tear gas, so you're already winning on me on that one. Um, I think our communities, you know, it's great to be here. It's great to be with so many of you that understand the issue, with so many of you that have been fighting for years. Um, but I think the people who need it the most, the people who need to have these conversations, are the people who thought the Muslim ban was the worst thing that had ever happened in the history of the United States. Uh, the people that uh, we're talking to are the people that, you know, are undocumented and have never committed a crime. So they thought, oh wow, like one day I'm going to be okay because I never did this crime that um, that they say that immigrants do. And and so when you talk to your community, that's where it's really at. You know, it, it's not going to happen on this mega mega playing field where we all think, you know, the federal Congress is one day going to kick in. Um, you know, unfortunately, it's in our communities, it's in our backyards right now. Um, and, and I think it always has been, but I think that we've, you know, as an immigrant, I was raised to believe that the United States was the greatest country in the world. Um, that my mom and dad left everything they had ever had um, and came here with nothing 
because this was the beacon of hope. This was the, you know, this was the, the place that they wanted to be in. And I grew up believing, why would anybody think that anything is wrong with the United States? And it isn't until you get older and you start to realize, wow, this is really what's happening. Or, you know, somebody would tell me on the bus, don't speak Spanish. And, and you start to think about, well, freedom, and I can't speak Spanish. Um, and so our communities have been dealing with this for so long. And our communities are now getting these tools that they need. You know, social media is a great platform. It's, um, it's a way for our community to come together and to say, you know, I thought I was the only undocumented person. I really believed I was the only undocumented person. None of my friends, none of my family um, are undocumented. And so for me, I was the only person that had ever committed this crime that they, they, they talked about on Fox News when I was little and that they would always show you know people jumping borders. And so right now is the moment when we can reach out to people, people who have never been to one of these events, people who have never been to a rally. Um, and, and we can't start off at a rally. You know, some people are terrified to go out there. So, People see uh, uh, rallies on TV and they see people being tear gassed. They see people you know, being confronted by the KKK. People are terrified of that. And so we need to make sure that we're giving all these tools, um, but that we're also helping people. Um, at least for, for my community, uh, what I've seen the most is people just want to hear that they belong. People just want to be told it's OK to be here. Um, and I think for me, you know, I think I have this great privilege, right? I have this uh, amazing ability to turn to, you know, turn to my right and say, hey, do I belong here? And he's gonna be like, yeah. But they don't have that at home. <laughs> uh, but they don't have that at home. They don't have somebody saying, hey, you belong here. They have a boss who is telling them, you know, all you contribute is this labor. Um, and so for us, I think the, the thing that we need the most right now is not only use these tools to come together, but to really have our communities organized. And that's why for me, the most important thing right now is our local community organizations. It's making sure that we're reaching out to them and saying, do you have the tools you need? Um, you know, I, I, every day I wake up and I'm afraid to look at the news. Um, and just the other day I saw that an organization in Washington, and I forgot their name, um, they were being sued by their, the state for providing these services to undocumented immigrants because they weren't providing the right paperwork. And it's like, that's what's happening right now. Um, and so for me, that's why it's so important that direct services and organizations that are in the community that actually have their pulse on what's happening, that's where we need to be right now. I'm gonna do one more question down the line and then we'll open it up uh, to questions from you. Marco, starting with you, speaking of reaching communities and, and reaching new voices uh, who are politicized or repulsed by what Trump is doing, uh, how important is it for us to prioritize reaching the blue, stop, blue dots in red states, that is, reaching voices who may not be readers of yours, for instance, who aren't um, you know, super politically active or aren't liberals themselves, but um, could be open to, to this new resistance? Yeah, uh, it's, it's not even blue dots. It's actually, we, we are by far the American majority uh, on the issues. And you know, last, last year, 97 million Americans did not vote that could have voted, 97 million. And uh, the bulk of those are our voters, single women, people of color. Uh, and whether they're suppressed or they're demoralized or they don't feel they have a stake or whatnot, you just go down the list. These are people that are natural voters who did not vote. So this is why it's so frustrating at times to see certain people within the uh, Democratic Party talk about uh, reaching these Working, cla working class people who are really trapped in, in fake news land at this point, right? They're, they're trapped by the Fox News bubble and they're not, they're not getting out of there. Um, and maybe do we even want them to come out of there without a change in attitudes towards the people that make up our party, right? No, no grabbing pussies, no, no, uh, no bullying, no, uh, no overt racism and xenophobia and all those things. Um, and if you needed those people for an electoral majority, you had an argument, but we actually have um, a large untapped pool of our voters uh, available. And I think that's one of the things that I'm hoping that the resistance is doing. I mean, if I was a billionaire, I would, I would throw $100 million into Texas and $100 million into Georgia and do nothing but GOTV, voter registration and turnout, nothing more. And those are blue states. By demographics, those are blue states. And so, uh, 
it pains me to see where some of this money is going. Uh, and it, it pains me to see that, that we have the resources, we have people with means that aren't investing in those organizations that are on the ground, resource starved, trying to get people to register to vote. So, um, what was the question? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I was answering it. I was answering it. Uh, and um, so that, I think, and you know, what's amazing is about the resistance is, is it's not that 400,000 women march in Washington, D.C. Because fa for the Fox News and the fake news world, they can block that out. It never happened, right? But it's different when your town of 80 up in uh, the north, literally the North Pole, uh, half of the town is out marching. You can't, you can't ignore that. And that to me is the beauty of this decentralized movement is that people are in the communities being present and being heard. And it's very difficult for conservatives, to, the conservative media to pretend that does not exist when people are in their face telling them how much uh, uh, they hate Trump and his policies and a party that is enabling him. I would add, um, from our perspective, uh, we've actually been surprised by the, the real um, strength of the indivisible groups who, or of the interest in organizing um, across the country. Um, we've seen just extraordinary geographic diversity. And in fact, uh, a lot of the strongest groups are um, in deep red areas. And you know what we hear from them is uh, they didn't have a, a venue to come together and to organize um, and to express their shared principles before. And so it actually really serves um, you know, something more than a, a forum for action. It's a community. Um, and I think that that also goes to, to something else that we need to be thinking about, which is that you know, on the, when we look at the right, they invest over the long term in local power and local organizing. Um, they're there for school board elections and everything up. And, you know, they're not there just to build the ter voter turnout uh, operation. They're there all year, every year. Um, and that's something that the left, you know, just doesn't, hasn't been able to do in the same way. And so part of, I think, what we have to do is figure out how um, how we build the best possible operation for 2018, but how we start by doing that by providing the local services and the local capacity that people, people know who you are when you come around to ask them to vote. And that's exactly it. Uh, you know, I'm from Nevada. Nevada is uh, two big, big blue dots and a lot of red. And when you think about it, that's what it is. It's these small communities that said, well, you know, we live out in the middle of nowhere, and there's 12 Democrats, and we get together, you know, at Patsy's house, um, because that's the only place where they feel safe expressing their ideas and saying, you know, they're Democrats. Uh, he, I think one of the most terrifying parts for me was a uh, one time driving from Las Vegas to Reno, and uh, we pulled over at a gas station, and it's this car full of people of color. Uh, we were we were driving up there and seeing a sticker that I'd never seen that had a noose on it and a picture of President Obama. And I'm just thinking, I've never seen that before. Um, and I know people have, but I had it until that moment. And then I met somebody from that same town that said, like, oh, I'm a Democrat. I voted Democrat since however long ago. And right now is those moments when they want to get together. They found other Democrats, whether it be because, you know, they had a blue shirt the day after the election or they were crying after the election, but they found each other. Um, and we have to start in those small offices. We have to get the school board, we have to get the city council, because that's how it's gonna build up. And I think as Democrats, we've been focusing a lot on the big picture and on the you know the important offices, which is very important. Um, and don't get me wrong, but that's where most of the money goes. Um, we have to focus on these small elections because no matter what, you know, town boards, um, zoning boards, small things that people don't even think about, but that are really important to our communities. Um, and so that's, that's to me the most important way to get to these smaller communities, uh, to these communities that are red. Um, and, and they may be red on a map, but when you go into them, which you know many of us don't go into them because we're like, oh, it's red, you know, why spend money there? Why canvas there? Why phone bank there? But then you start talking to people and they start talking about these issues and, and you know, uh, whether they, they agree with one issue but they don't on another, they're gonna go with what they need at that moment. Um, and, and if you've been helping them, if you've been there, if you've been phone banking, if you've been talking to them, they're gonna, they're gonna make sure to turn out. And, and, and going off what you said about, about voting, I think if it wasn't so important, why would you know, the other party be trying so hard to take it away from people? I, you know, I can't vote, um, I, I'm, I'm undocumented, I can't, 
but it pains me to think of these people that can vote, but they can't because they didn't have the right ID, or they didn't have a birth certificate, or they didn't have a voting center nearby. Uh, and that's where we really need to be concentrating. And yes, um, you know, I think as, as, a, as an undocumented person, sometimes I, I, I doubt in the system. Not every day, but sometimes I think, well, yeah, that, that's totally possible. When people are like, oh my gosh, I don't know how Donald Trump won. And I'm like, well, I do. Like, those are the same people that were writing on my Twitter to deport me and, and writing to deport these uh, Im uh, this immigrants that were US citizens at this point. Um, and so when people are like very surprised that Donald Trump won, I'm like, no, that's not surprising to me. But what is surprising to me is how little people understand um, not only that how important their vote is, but how much people want it, that they're willing to do anything to take it away. The very last word, and then we'll go to questions. Yep, a few closing thoughts. One is uh, that people want to experience success. So the people that have withdrawn completely from the system are people for whom the system just hasn't worked for. So if you want those people to be reinvested, like you should work to build a win for them. Like people want to be a part of the system in some ways. The second is about the difference between equity and equality is that people confuse it too. Equality is everybody gets the same thing. Equity is people get what they deserve. And the fight for justice is almost always a fight about equity. So when we look at like funding for school systems in most urban places, like we don't want them, we don't want every school district in a state to get the same amount of funding because they don't need the same amount of funding. What does it mean for cities that have a lot of poor and black kids to get not enough money to fund to fund the impact of institutional racism, and this is always about equity. Uh, it's not often about quality in the sense that people think it is. The third is about the language that we use. So when we think about Charlottesville, when all those people showed up with the tiki torches and it was on the news, <laughs> and when you saw the, the news, like they wrote like white nationalists. And you're like, well, what nation is yours? Right? This isn't yours. Like you didn't, this is not, this was like Native Americans, this is like First Nations, right? This is not. This is not yours. Like, how do we not call that white supremacy? And like, when we are afraid to talk about the real issues, like, we'll never win. When people gloss that over and sort of make that out to be sort of a movement, like they literally, it was like protesters. And you're like, the KKK is not protesters. Like, when we have reduced them to protesters, like we've just sort of lost, we've lost the battle. And the fourth thing is that I think it's not very sexy, but I think it's real about what are the what are the what are the root cause issues? So we think about immigration. In the 2009 House Appropriations Bill, there's a quota for ICE. ICE has to detain a minimum of 34,000 people a day. It's the only law enforcement agency with a daily quota, with any quota, but the daily quota. So there are a lot of people fighting about ICE, but until the quota changes, they're just gonna arrest a lot of people because the law says that they have to arrest that many people. And ICE doesn't have enough detention facilities, so they rent out local jails and prisons, and people just don't know, right? Or people don't know that welfare is at the same dollar amount as it was since 2009, like those sort of things. Or the police have killed three people a day uh, every day in the past two years. Like it's things that people just don't know. So the things that get the most airtime are like body cameras, which is important police training and stuff like that, but of the 400 people killed by the police this year alone, only in two cases has an officer been charged. And whether you like love the police or not, I just like refuse to believe that 400 people did something wrong and the police were just always right in every case. But again, these are the things that we don't talk about in public like we should. All right, questions, yes ma'am. It's coming. Microphone's coming. Okay? Hi, can you hear me? No? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm Jane Whitney from Connecticut, and you all kind of represent a snapshot, to me at least. When I talk about there's a silver lining in this, cata you know, this cataclysmic event that we're all sort of suffering through, you all really represent it, so I want to thank you for doing everything you're doing. of like middle-aged women in, in Connecticut, Northwestern Connecticut, poring over the Indivisible Manual or suddenly discovering your online petitions for John Ossoff or Rob Quist. And it's just really changed a lot of things. But what concerns me, what concerns me, sustaining the energy and also how are you addressing the divisions within the Democratic Party? I mean, is what you're doing enough to transcend or to somehow help resolve the factions within the Democratic Party? Thank you. You guys. Leah, do you wanna? Oh, I guess I'm getting the perky. Um, there's gonna be factions in the Democratic Party. The Republicans are split three ways. 
and you find a way to coexist when necessary, and then you fight when the opportunity arises. And right now, it's actually, if we're going to fight, now is a really good time to do it. Um, so, uh, and, and you know what's ironic about sort of this, the divisions in, in, you know, the kind of Bernie holdouts. There's no good word for them, because I don't want to smear the Bernie supporters in general. But you know, there's a crowd that's arguing, and then there's the Hillary crowd or the establishment. And these are all kind of BS distinctions. Because um, we all agree on everything. I mean, there's no disagreement on income inequality and police brutality and a sane immigration policy. Uh, because if there was, they'd be Republicans. So <laughs> they, there is actually, so what happens? What, what's going on here? And really what it comes down to is an issue of emphasis. Like some people think economic equality fixes things. And those of us who live in these communities know that that's not the case. Sandra Bland had a job. And uh, you, you know, we have Latinos with jobs getting uh, deported and families being split up. And uh, Jewish cemeteries, I mean, I, I think Jewish people have jobs. So it, it's the idea that bigotry, I, I mean, was Donald Trump grabbing the pussies of unemployed poor women? I mean, the idea that income equality is going to uh, solve these sort of core issues of, of racism and xenophobia and bigotry, it's, it's kind of absurd and almost insulting to those of us who have to live in that reality every single day. So um, really, it's emphasis. It's help those of us who have to deal with immediate threats to our very existence. Because once we feel secure in our bodies and in our families and our communities, we're going to fight really hard for income uh, equality. Because you know, Latinos are the number one supporters of socialism. If you poll it, like the idea of socialism, Latinos number one. But you know, right now our families are being split up. So let us focus on saving our families because that's uh, as opposed. And then, and that's why I like what Tom Steyer was saying about working within those communities because it's kind of hard to focus about Florida being underwater in 50 or 100 years when our family, when our communities are burning today. So that that's what we ask. So I, I would just say I think we have to do we have to be able to walk and chew gum at the same time here on a, on a lot of different fronts. I think the Democratic Party has um, a number of different arguments that they have to they have to continue to resolve. But at the same time, um, I think there's an enormous opportunity uh, both both to continue the energy of the resistance, but also to start to craft the positive agenda um, and to show what progressive government can do for people on a local and state level. And so I think that's really the place to um, start to have some of those conversations now. I think one thing that we stress you know, on the national level is for, for advocacy, your leverage is often um, about responding to what's being put on the agenda. And without the power to set the agenda, um, you, know, you have the most leverage when you're responding to what's currently happening. But that's not true at the state and local level. You have the ability to push for something that's more meaningful and start to deliver for people um, and show what a progressive government really looks like. All right, on that note, we're unfortunately out of time. Please give a huge round of applause to this remarkable panel.